Now, last night someone came in and, uh, you know, they asked, well, were we selling our church building? Because it says under new management on the church sign out there, you know, that's what's out there. And I actually used this particular theme oh, probably about 10 years ago saying, yeah, they were wondering who was going to be the pastor, you know, <laughs> or maybe we're just going to turn into Kentucky Fried Chicken or something. I don't know. You know, what they were thinking, but uh, we're talking about under new management, but we're, we're not talking about it in the way that they think we're, we're talking about it. You know, when we see a sign under new management, we know immediately that the business ex is experiencing change, right? There's something changing here. It's under new management now, you know, and that change is really all about leadership, and the, uh, the management and, and, and new motivations and new methods and, and all this kinds of stuff happens. And, and this is what I'm talking about today where you and I discover how to live under new management. It's a game changer. It changes everything in our lives. You know, um, I had read uh, some years ago, I read some uh, principles about leadership, and then I saw some articles and the news and all, and it was talking of, about a, uh, a business which goes and buys out all other failing businesses. And uh, then they make a new start of the thing, and it always succeeds. And this particular business, it was buying out a ski slope. It was in a great location, just wasn't making no money. And also, this guy came in, he bought out the ski slope, and then the manager who had been working at the ski slope for many years came and applied for the job to be the manager, and the owner said, if you could have turned this ski slope around, you had already done it by now. And they fired everybody who was minutely related to it because they, they were talking about new management. Now, sometimes... When God comes into our life and he wants to manage us and we go, well, Lord, you can manage this, but I'll take care of this area over here. Nah, it don't really work. He's going to take the whole ball of wax, you know, because he specializes in bringing about transformation in our lives, you know. So who, whose management do you live under right now? Think about that. You know, I was reading about a fellow in the Bible you know, his name was Jonah. Think about it. Whose control did this prophet, this man of God, whose control did he live under? It says in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The Lord gave this message to Jonah. And he said in verse 2, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked the people are. But Jonah got up. And went in, there's Nineveh, Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He was operating under old management. Has God ever told you to do something and you did the exact opposite? Mm hmm. Now, to a, an outsider just looking in, God says something to you. You get up and you take off and you go, whoa, well, look at that man go, look at that woman go. Oh, that's awesome. They just didn't recognize you was going the opposite way you were supposed to go. They didn't perceive that. Well, it says here in uh, verse 3, but Jonah got up and he went the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. And he bought a ticket. God didn't provide a ticket for him to go and disobedience to him. He had to buy his own ticket. He bought a ticket and he went on board, hoping to escape from the Lord by sailing to Tarshish when God wanted him to go this way. Y'all remember what ultimately happened, right? You remember this great big old fish that swallowed him and all that went? We'll talk about that again at another time. But in the Bible, we read about a, a little short guy. He was a tax collector. His name was Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, all tax collectors, 
tax collectors were pretty much hated by the population because tax collectors made their money by overcharging people their taxes. And they really, really were not liked. And this guy was very short. But he heard that Jesus was coming into the area where he lived. So he went out, and because he was so short, you know, you just got to jump up and try to see what's going on. He got out there, climbed up in a tree before anybody even got there so he could see what was going on. And as Jesus and the crowd were coming his way, Jesus was healing people. He was preaching this good news and encouraging people, and even children were allowed to participate and all. And when Jesus, walking with this crowd of people down the road, when he got to a certain location, he just stopped and looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come on down here. I'm going to your house today. And Zacchaeus, the Bible tells he just, you know, you know, just popped down that tree, just stood down that tree, just glowing from ear to ear, you know, and it's just, this is fantastic. Jesus is going to my house. So everybody hated tax collectors, you know. I don't know if there's a whole lot of difference between them now than it was years ago or not, you know. <laughs> Just teasing, kind of. But anyhow, uh, Jesus went to his house and he invited his fellow tax collectors and all. And Jesus didn't tell Zacchaeus what to do, but Zacchaeus just volunteered. He says, anything that I have stolen from anybody, and that's the way they got their pay, by overcharging people, he says, I'll repay it four times as much. Jesus didn't ask him to do that. He just volunteered that. Because it was a transformation took place. Zacchaeus was operating under new management. And it was obvious people were going like, what happened to Zacchaeus? It was obvious that he was operating now under new management. And do you remember, you know, in the Bible when Jesus was choosing his disciples? You know, and how did he choose a disciple? He said, follow me. And that's what disciple is, is a follower. And uh, Jesus came to these uh, fishermen, and he just said, hey, follow me. And they dropped their nets, and, and they left their boats to their families and all, to dad and whoever, and they just followed Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, you've been catching the fish, but I'm going to teach you how to become a fisher of uh, men. And that's exactly what he did. It was just fantastic to see the transformation that was taking place. Now, you know, lots of people go, you know, well, it's, it's really all about me, myself, and uh, I. And a lot of people live under that philosophy. That's under old management, and it's not very successful management either. There was another tax collector. As a matter of fact, the first book in the New Testament was named after him. What was his name? Matthew. And Jesus and his disciples was coming into town, and Matthew was there at this big old table. He's got guards around there. He's charging people taxes and taxes and taxes and all. And Jesus just walked by and asked him to be a disciple. He just simply said, follow me. And he went on about his business. Jesus did. And Matthew just got up and left his money, bags of money and everything, and just walked away from it all. We're talking about he chose to live under new management. There was a transformation that took place in Matthew's life, and he, 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 he made an eternal difference with the rest of his life. It was so empty and hollow and shallow. He, he easily just walked away because he wanted to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. There's another incident. If you'll remember in the New Testament, there was a, a man who was demon-possessed. And he was powerful when this demon, you know, began to control him. And he would hurt himself and he'd hurt other people. And people came together, took a bunch of them, and they would chain him up somewhere. And because of the powers of these demons in him, he would break the chains. And then he would wander around in the cemeteries and, and uh, amongst the tombs and all and cry and scream and take sharp rocks and cut himself and, and all that kinds of stuff was going on. And Jesus was coming, you know, in a ship with uh, all of his disciples and they came to the shore there and this demon-possessed man come running toward them and Jesus cast the demons, these legions, legions of demons out of him. Do you remember where the Bible says he cast them? Into a bunch of pigs. It's the guy who had hundreds of pigs, cast them into the pigs. The pigs ran downhill and they just ran off into the water and they drowned themselves. 
You know, and that's the, the purpose of the devil. The Bible says the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's what demonic powers are all about. People heard about all these dead pigs floating around in the water. They came down there to see what in the world was going on. And this demon-possessed man, who everybody knew about, you know, he was clothed and sitting in his right mind listening to Jesus. And everybody's looking, it's like, whoa, what happened? What happened? They see a guy who is living now operating under new management. And when Jesus got ready to leave, this demon possessed, who was demon possessed, no longer is, he threw his leg over the side of the boat and said, I'm going with you guys. And Jesus said, no, I want you to stay here. There's 10 cities here, and I want you, everybody knows you. You've got reputation here. You go and you tell people what I did for you. And then when the gospel came and was preached in those 10 cities later on, they received the gospel because of that demon-possessed man had went and shared what Jesus had done for him. He lived the rest of his life under new management. New management changes everything. Changes the way you think. Changes the way you do everything. Listen to what it says here in Isaiah 55, 8. God says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. God don't think the way you and I do. Now, you and I can learn to think the way he does, but we don't naturally do that. we got to spend some time in his word, and we learn how God thinks. You know, we learn the way God does things, and we can learn those things, but God don't do them the way we do. That's what he says. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. We're talking about under new management, there's a whole new way to think. And a whole new way to do things. You know, we do things differently. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For everyone, uh, and, and what percentage is everyone? 100%. 100%. For everyone has sinned. Is anybody in here never sinned? Just raise your hand and keep it up if you've never sinned. Because if you got your hand up, you're sinning right now while lying. Anyhow, it says, For everyone has sinned. We all, what percentage is all? 100. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. You know, and the standard of new management is to be like Christ. That's the standard of new management, to be like Jesus is. But everybody was very self-centered, very selfish, you know, had a sinful and a selfish nature. Anyhow, uh, Billy Graham once said, he says, before you can get a man saved... Yeah, God, I get him lost. And what he meant was, and the scriptures tells us, that's why the, the commandments were given. Because some people think, well, what do I need to be saved from? I'm a good person. Ever heard people, well, I'm a good person. I never murdered nobody. Or I never did this or I did that. I, you know that. And all but with the truth of it is, the Bible says we've all, we were born with a disease called sin. We were born with that disease and the wages of sin is death. So Billy Graham was talking about how people need to discover that there's sin control in their life from the beginning of time so they understand that they do need a Savior. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Once you were, and that one word there, were, is referring to something past tense. It's behind us. He says, Once you were, Dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Because we're all born with sin. We all have a sinful nature. Beyond mama or daddy, what's one of the very first words all children learn first? No. no. It's because of that sinful nature. No. 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 You see that sinful nature they were born. We were all born that way, you see. We all need a Savior, not because something we did, but just because sin was passed from generation to generation. So we, we understand that, that whole concept here. Let me see here. It says, uh, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, verse 2 says, you used to, there again, past tense, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world, he is a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. 
Verse 3 says, all of us used to, there again, that's past sense, all of us used to live that way under old management, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. Old management, that's the way we used to live. That's the, the, the way everybody, 100% of us used to live. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, he, talking about Jesus, he has given us great and precious promises. And these are the promises that enable you to share, to share something of this God's. And these promises enable you to share his divine nature. No longer a sinful nature, but these promises in God's word enable us to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desire, which is talking about, you know, covetous and lust. And then verse four here, and read to you have another translation. It says, your tickets, talking about the promises of God, is your tickets to participation in the life of God. The promises of God is your boarding pass. It's your ticket. It's your boarding pass, if you would, to participation in the life of God. The promises of Almighty God allow us to participate in his divine nature, living under you know, new management, no longer being controlled by the old management. You know, excuse me, just saying. Now, I'd like to show you a, a picture of something you have probably never, ever seen. This is an original. Isn't that awesome? You ever seen anything like that before? Oh, maybe it's not original after all. But let me ask you, how many of you would testify today that you live under new management? Do you? So we can put this right here. You should carry this everywhere you go. Anybody else live under new management? You should carry, you guys, we, we got to get a whole bunch of these painted up so you can carry them with you everywhere you go. T-shirts, something better than a T-shirt, something better than a picture here. You know what? When Christ brings about a transformation in your life, people know it. They recognize, Zacchaeus, what happened to you? Matthew, what happened to you? You are so different. It shows up, doesn't it? And you know what we're going to do? We're going to leave this right here. So before you leave today, you might want to get your friend to come up here and you hold it and get a picture. You let them take a picture of you on your phone. Or you can stand up there. The living under new management, and the truth of it is, when you are really living under new management, it becomes obvious. People see it, whether they see a sign like that or not, they see that there is a difference, don't they? There's a transformation that has taken place. New management becomes obvious. Hey, there's better service, you know. Everything's different when you're talking about genuine new management. He says here in Jeremiah 15, verse 6, he says, When I discovered your words or your promises in the Bible, when I discovered your words, I devoured them. I was hungry for righteousness. I was hungry for God. I don't know if you remember when you first dis discovered God's word and, and, and you just devoured it. It's like, I can't get enough of this. I'm hungry, you know, for God's word. I am genuinely hungry for God's word. And I've been hungry for his word since I was a teenager. It's just like, wow, this is awesome. This is a game changer. This is constantly transforming me and it will constantly transform you. The promises that Almighty God has given unto us. It's like a ticket that allows us to participate in his divine nature. No longer controlled by the sinful nature. Jeremiah, once again, when I discovered your words or your promises, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight. It changes things. It produces faith and courage and hope. It genuinely does. Now, years ago, there was a 
popular movie, probably many of you never heard of this, is years ago, there was this movie, and it was called The Way We Were. Probably nobody ever remembers that, do you? You know that ages you when you raise your hand, you know, right? Just like I, I, I raised mine too. But uh, this movie, the characters spent most of their time, you know, uh, talking about, you know, uh, sentimental uh, things, things that they were looking at in the past, you know, uh, what were we call the good old days. Have you ever used that term? Oh, you remember the good old days, you know? Oh, the good old days before we had electricity, we had to use kerosene lamps and candles. In the good old days before we had electricity, we had to carry buckets down to the creek and bring our water back up here. And most of our time and energy was gardening and hunting and fishing just to provide enough food to survive. The good old days. You know something, lots of times when people talk about the good old days, they forget that it wasn't really as good as they remembered it being. You know, it was a lot of work. And a lot of people talk about that. I've heard them talking about all the good old days before I knew Jesus, you know. And we used to do this and we used to, but they forget about all the consequences and all the misery they had along with that and the hopelessness that they had and the darkness that was in them. Talking about, oh, the good old days. The good old days before we knew Jesus, we were dead in our sins. That's the truth of it in them good old days. It wasn't so good really, as we thought they were. You know, um, our sinful appetite, our sinful nature is very self-destructive. Did you know that? We f pursue after things that it's not good for us, and we pursue it, and we pursue it, and it's really not healthy for us. Let me just uh, show you how this works. I just brought, you know, I had a knife, but I, you know, that I always have on me, that one there, but this one's not big enough to portray what I want to show you. So I just brought one of my little bit bigger knives that I always have. It's always real close to me. I put my microphone back on there. And this is, this is a pretty cool knife here, you know. And it will shave you. If I have any volunteers, I'll prove that point. If you, okay. But anyhow, the Eskimos, the Eskimos, when they had to deal with some very vicious wolves, you know, they would come in, fight against their uh, sled dogs, and there was a threat to their children, their family, and steal any food that they might have somewhere, you know, stash or whatever, and they would have to deal with these, uh, these wolves, you know, and they would use their wolf hide to make garments to keep them from freezing in the winter and all. But what an Eskimo would do, he would take a razor sharp knife and uh, he would dip it in like seal blood, you know, in the cold conditions, that knife, uh, that seal blood just froze to it, you know, a layer like you make a candle and then you dip it in it again or any other animal blood that he would have around, he would dip it in it and the, the blood would freeze and freeze and freeze and it would build up kind of thick around the knife. And then he would take the knife and he would attach it into the ground somehow. I'm not sure how he did it, but he would attach it so it wouldn't move. And then he left it there all night long. And old wolf has got a tremendous nose, a sensitive nose, would smell that blood. And he's a carnivore, and he is attractive. He's got an appetite for blood. And he would come to that thing. He would begin to lick the seal blood off of the knife. And he would lick it, and he would lick it, and his warm tongue. And the more he licked it, the more he wanted. He had a passion and appetite for that blood. And he would lick it, and he would lick it, and he would lick most of the, the frozen blood off of the knife. And the knife was so sharp, he didn't even feel the, the razor sharpness as it cut his tongue as he was licking it. And the, the more he tasted that warm blood now that was flowing from him, he, he just became more obsessed with licking it and licking it and licking it. And in the morning, you would find a dead wolf laying beside the knife. Does that make sense? His appetite killed him. It was, he was destroyed because of his appetite. And there are sometimes, there may be things that we have an appetite for. Might be something that you're looking at or something you're partaking of. And the more you do it, the more you want it. And, and, and you don't even perceive how harmful it's being to you. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
There's all kinds of things like that, you know, all these appetites, all kinds of uh, addictions and all kinds of things that would try to control our life. And we must be careful of such things like that. God wants you to live under new management and not to be controlled by old appetites. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. They're living under old management, hopelessly, hope without hope. And that's what happens in this world. There's a lot of people without hope and they kind of give up and throw in the towel. And he says, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. And the Bible says that Satan is the author of confusion. When confusion comes in and begins to take over your life, that's the devil's work. It's a really a, a selfish nature, a sinful nature that the devil has access to and he controls you as you're living under and being controlled by old management. Verse 18 says, their minds are full of darkness, you know. Their minds are full of darkness and they wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds. They, they've intentionally closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. A willful blindness. Now, do you like it? You like the dark? No. Nobody really is real fond of the dark. And you know where I'm going with this, don't you? I do like flashlights. You know that, right? I just got one of my favorite old flashlights up here. Sorry about that, guys. Yeah, that's why you should wear your sunglasses to church, you know, because <laughs> you never know when I might pull out a flashlight. Flashlights are wonderful to have in the dark, is it not? You know, when I go up on a mountain, I always have two lights, minimum of two lights on me, and these use the same big battery, okay, and I carry a couple extra batteries with me, and when I go hiking up on the mountain where early in the morning or late at night, I have this, it's just my headlamp, it doesn't shine that far. You know, I mean, it shines pretty good, but uh, not as far as this one does. But you know what? It's safer to hike in the darkness than it is to hike in the daytime. I, and I'm not exaggerating because when I'm hiking at night, any animal that's up there, his eyes will shine. And I'll see eyes shine, and then I'll turn this one on to see what, if I need to pull something else out, you know. <laughs> uh, but I see it. And I am very safe in the dark. In the daytime, you can't see eyes reflecting if they're behind the bush. Or you can't see them. Well, I'm still not too worried about that either. But we do like light, do we not? You know, if we don't want to get rid of all the electricity, do we? I mean, can you imagine what's that going to be like? Get rid of all the electricity. You're going to stumble around. You're going to do everything the hard way. You're going to be a little more nervous, a little bit more frightened and things like that you know but it says here verse 18 their minds are full of darkness and the scripture itself says his word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path I can see close at hand I can see far enough away when I've got the promises of almighty God it helps me it says their minds are full of darkness you know we need light in our life and his word is that light they, they, they wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. Verse 19 says, they have no sense of shame. There's no sense of shame. There, there's no, you know, sense of uh, disgrace. There's no embarrassment. No matter what evil things we do, we're just blinded. We don't care. It don't bother us, you know. There's no shame involved in it because sin is controlling our lives. That's what he's talking about here. But he wants us to live under new management. And he says here, and read verse 19, he says, They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Then Romans 7 verse 18 says, And I know that nothing good lives in me. You hear what the author of Romans is saying? I know that nothing good lives in me. That is, in my sinful nature, I want to do what is right. But I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. I need new management. I'm living under hopeless 
confusion. I'm living in the darkness and the things I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. I'm living under old management and it's controlling my life. It's my old sinful nature is what he's talking about here. You know, and he goes on to say in verse 23, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. But that can change. You don't have to live under old management. You don't have to live, you know, as a miserable person no more. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Who can free me from this? And then look at verse 24 again in another translation. The King James says, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, the Romans had some real cruel ways to kill people. They had a cross that they would hang people on, make it as miserable as possible. But if you were a murderer, they would take a a, a dead body, a a corpse, and they would chain it to you so you couldn't get away from it. They would take a corpse and chain it to you and then kind of set you free and you could do whatever you wanted to do, but you couldn't get rid of this dead corpse. And it, it, it generated all kinds of disease and infection. And as the disease and the, the maggots and all the stuff was eating that old dead corpse, before you know it, whatever was in that old corpse, it was transferred to you. And you died a slow, miserable death. I mean, that's just what the Romans did. I mean, it wasn't a good thing at all. But it helped me to understand what the scripture's talking about. Um. There's an old sinful nature. It's dead and it tries to cling to us and it tries to control us and and it it breeds death to us. That's why Jesus died. It says over here, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Who will deliver me from the body of this death? Verse 25 Thank God, exclamation mark. The answer is in Jesus Christ. Our old sinful nature, you know, does to us what that corpse does. And Jesus, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen to what it says here in Romans 3.23. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Verse 24. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve to go to heaven. We don't deserve to be forgiven. We don't deserve God's kindness. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. We're right with him. We've been forgiven. we become his child. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. He freed us from carrying the corpse because Jesus paid the price. In our place. Jesus took the bullet for us. Jesus pushed us out of the road and the car hit him. He made the sacrifice for you and for me. It says here in verse 25, for God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they do what? When they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shed in his blood. The Bible tells us that if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised us from the dead, we'll be saved. A lot of people have this false idea. Well, I'm going to get to heaven one day. God's going to weigh my good deeds against my bad deeds. And if my good outweighs my bad, I'm led into heaven. It has nothing to do with your deeds. Because we're born with a disease called sin. And only faith in the Lord Jesus Christ removes all sin's control from us. That's just the way it is. Romans chapter 6, verse 12, it says, Do not, and see, we have a choice in this, do not let sin control the way you live. You have a choice in who manages you. You have a choice. 
the enemy of our soul would try to dictate. And before Christ, you didn't really have a choice. You were under the devil's control, under old management. When you accept Jesus Christ in, you have a choice now. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires, that old management. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Don't let your hands or your eyes or your ears or your mouth or your nose or any part of your body serve sin. That's what he's telling us right there. Instead, give, which means surrender to yield. It says instead, give yourselves what? What percentage is completely? Give yourselves completely to God. You ever heard the term lock, stock, and barrel? You know, that's a term. Now, I have a muzzle loader. You know, it's a muzzle loader. You put the powder in, then you put the patch, you put the lead ball, and then you take a rod and you ram it all the way down there. That's a muzzle loader. It's like Daniel Boone used to have and all. And the lock is this part here that you cock it back that creates a spark and all, you know. That's the lock. And then the wood part back here and over here, that's the stock. And then there's a barrel. And lock, stock, and barrel means the whole gun. It's the whole thing. It's, it's an outdoorsman's term, you know. You know, lock, stock, and barrel means the whole thing. Outdoorsmen are, are pretty smart guys because they also came up with the concept hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Lock, stock, and barrel, hook, line, and sinker is talking about complete. The whole ball of wax is what he's talking about. And here he says, give yourselves completely. Lock, stock, and barrel, hook, line, and sinker. Give yourselves completely to God. For you were, that's past tense, you were dead. But now you have new life. Now you're living under new management. It's a change. Transformation has happened. People will see. You may not be totally perfect, but you are so much more different because you're living under new management, under Jesus' control. And unless we live under his control, we will run aground, you know. We're going to run aground. We're going to get stuck. We're not going to go very far. But when you're living with him, he, he, he's a game changer. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says, give, which is talking about to yield and surrender. It says, give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a lift and a holy sacrifice. Let your body be a living testimony of the transformation that you're living under new management. Let your life be a testimony. People go, there's something different about you, you know. Even if they didn't know you in the past, they're like, you are unlike anybody I ever know. You're kind of like, you're a lot like, you're a lot like Jesus. They see a transformation. You're different. You're not being controlled by the old sinful nature. You're, you're, you're forgiving, you're loving, you're kind. And all. And that's what he's saying right here. Give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living, holy sacrifice. You know, he died for you, so he wants you to live for him. And he goes on to say, let them be a living and a holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him with our body with all that we are as we offer it as a living sacrifice and we live for him. Verse 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, old management. Don't just follow old management. Don't do what the rest of the world does. Don't act like the rest of the world. He says, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And his promises when you read his promises, you begin to think differently. And when you learn his ways, you begin to act differently. A transformation, and it becomes obvious almost as much as carrying a sign around saying, under new management, just your life is a testimony that new management has taken over. And then he goes and says here, then, you know, if you let him transform you into a new person by changing the way you think, then you will learn to know God's will. Would you like to know God's will? Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, is pleasing, and is perfect. Just another scripture or so, and we'll be pretty much done. Second um, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, anyone, what percentage is anyone? 100%, anyone who belongs to Christ 
has become a new person living under new management. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun living under a new management. Oh, what a wonderful pleasure and joy it is living under new management. The, the benefits are out of this world. The profits are higher than ever. The conditions are better living under new management. And then he goes on to say in verse 18, and all of this costs you dearly. Oh, wait a minute. What does it say? Yes. And all of this is a gift from God. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You don't deserve it. And all of this is a gift from God, belonging to Christ, being a new person, your old life being gone. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back. He brought us back and he bought us back also with the, the lifeblood of his son Jesus. And he, he brought us back to himself through Christ. Oh, there was a purchase. Jesus gave his lifeblood for you and me and now we can live under new management. And I'm going to tell you, it is awesome. It is fantastic. It is out of this world. When you begin to live under God's control, under new management. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21, since you have heard about Jesus and you've learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature. Since you learned about Jesus, throw off. That's something you can do. Your old sinful nature. And your former, your past way of life. You know, I'm talking about, and I don't know if you want me to open this or not. We usually throw these in the dumpster. Uh, is it, any volunteers want to stick your head down here? And, it might be pretty rotten. Could be, but what does the Bible tell us here? Throw, fling, hurl, toss, chuck. Pitch, heave, lob, throw off. Yeah. Your old sinful nature, throw it off. How many want to just pile the garbage up into your room till it reaches the ceiling? Don't even use garbage bags. Just chuck it in there. Live with it. Right? He says, since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth, and the truth does what? Set you free. And you have learned the truth that comes from him. Throw off your old sinful nature and your former, your past way of life. The old uh, uh, management that you used to live under. And he says, throw it off, which is corrupted. It's tainted and it's tarnished. Throw it off, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit <laughs> renew your thoughts and attitude. Let the Spirit renew. Let the Spirit restore and repair. That's what he's talking about. Let the Spirit renew, restore and repair your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature. And you got a ticket for it. It's the promises of God that allow you to, to, to be a partner with Almighty God to partake of his divine nature no longer controlled by the old sinful nature. Put on the new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. I'm going to tell you, when you begin to live under new management, it changes the way you think. I'm a mother of three. 14, ages 14, 12, and 3 years old. And I've recently completed my college degree. The last class I had to take was sociology. And the teacher was absolutely inspiring with the qualities that I wish every human being had been graced with. Her last project of the term was called Smile. The class was asked to go out and smile at three people and document their reactions. Sounds like a good homework project, don't you think? If you want to do it, that's okay with me. I'm a very friendly person and I always smile at everyone and say, hello, anyway. So I thought this would be a piece of cake, literally. Soon after we were assigned to the project, my husband, my youngest son, and I went to McDonald's on a crisp March morning. It was just our way of sharing special playtime with our son. We were standing in line waiting to be served when all of a sudden 
everyone around us begin to back away. And then even my husband began to back away. I didn't move. I didn't move an inch. And an overwhelming feeling of panic welled up inside of me as I turned to see why they had moved. As I turned around, I smelled a horrible, dirty body smell. And there standing behind me were two poor homeless men. As I looked down at the shortest gentleman close to me, he was smiling. His beautiful sky blue eyes were full of God's light as he searched for acceptance. He said, good day. As he counted a few coins that he had been clutching, the second man fumbled with his hands as he stood behind his friend, and I realized that the second man was mentally deficient. And the blue-eyed gentleman really had become his salvation. I held my tears as I stood there with them. And the young lady at the counter asked him what they wanted. And he said, coffee is all, miss, because that was all they could afford to be able to sit in a restaurant and warm up. They had to buy something. They just wanted to be warm. And then I really felt it. A compulsion so great, I almost reached out and embraced the little man with the blue eyes. That is when I noticed that all eyes in the restaurant were set on me, judging my reaction. I smiled and I asked the young lady behind the counter to give me two more breakfast meals on a separate tray. And I then walked around the corner to the table that the men had chosen as a resting spot. And I put the tray on their table and I laid my hand on the blue eyed gentleman's cold hand. And he looked up at me with tears in his eyes and said, thank you. I leaned over and I began to pat his hand and I said, I did not do this just for you. God is here working through me to give you hope. And you know, I think we could probably identify with that before our day is over. Mm-hmm. That God's here working through me to give you hope. Maybe it's a cup of coffee. Maybe it's raking somebody's leaves, shoveling a little bit of snow, whatever, a million different things it could be. God is here working through me to give you hope. I started to cry as I walked away to join my husband and son. And when I sit down, my husband, he smiled at me and he said, that's why God gave you to me, honey, to give me hope. We held hands for a moment, and at that time, we knew that only because of the grace that we had been given were we able to give. That day showed me the pure light of God's sweet love. I returned to college on the last evening of class, and with this story in hand, I turned it in, my project, and the instructor read it. And then she looked up at me and said, can I share this with the class? And I slowly nodded as she got the attention of the whole class. And she began to read. And that is when I knew that we as human beings and being part of God share this need to heal people and be healed. In my own way, I had touched the people at McDonald's, my husband, my son, the instructor, and every soul that shared the classroom on that last day that I spent as a college student. I graduated with one of the biggest lessons I would ever learn, and it was unconditional love and acceptance. That was it. And I do believe that God is working in you and in me to touch other men, women, boys, and girls, and to give them hope. He's on the move, doing that in anybody who surrenders themselves to him and will live under new management. And let him manage your schedule and what you do. Let him manage you pulling out a couple extra bucks and buying a breakfast 
for a couple of homeless men. And he manages us and he controls us. And what joy it is to, to find that our purpose is God's purpose. And he's changing lives with these little old things like that. One final scripture, and I'm done, I promise. Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4. So there's actually two scriptures slid in here. <laughs> Philippians 2, 3 says, Don't be selfish. Don't live to make a good impression on others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. That's God's kind of thoughts. Thinking of others as better than yourself. And then it goes on to say, don't think only about your own affairs. That's man kind of thoughts. It's only thinking about me, myself, and I. But thinking of others is God kind of thoughts, you see. Don't think only about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and what they are doing. Let's let God begin to really work through us. Today even, tomorrow, this coming week, you know, when we begin to recognize that God's here, he's working in you and me to give hope to other people. On your weekly challenge, it just simply says, I choose to live under new management. It's a choice that I make. I'm going to live under God's management. Let him control me from now on. If that's you, just check it off, drop it in the tithe box. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, I ask that you would work in us, work in me, work in our church family here, for almighty God. Every man, woman, boy, and girl, Lord, as we're learning to live under your management, under new management, we want you to work in us. We want you to work in us in such a way to give hope to the people who are in our sphere of influence, our family, our friends, our neighbors, the place where we work. May your love become evident. May your nature, that will not be known as being religious and preachy, but will become known as kind and loving and forgiving, a whole lot like Jesus. May we become known as people who are under new management. As our heads are bowed, I would ask you to join me to reaffirm your faith in Christ. And maybe you're here or watching online and you'd like to just declare your faith in him for the very first time. Would you pray as we reaffirm our faith or declare it for the first time? Would you join me? Dear Heavenly Father, I love you. I believe that you love me. And that's why you sent your son Jesus. I believe he died in my place to wash all my sins away. I believe that Jesus rose from the dead and is knocking at the door of my heart. I open wide that door and I welcome Jesus as my Savior as my Lord and my King. I am truly sorry for my sinful ways. I want to live the rest of my life under new management. And empower me, oh God, to represent you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen.